like I stated, it is good to have you all back here again. It is good to, uh, to have our online audience back with us again. And uh, some folks have asked, uh, is this live streamed? Uh, no, this is recorded. And uh, so it is, it is a kind of an advantageous thing because if you click on the link in the email, you get to watch it anytime you want. And so you don't have to worry about all of the, the added uh, stressors there of uh, the internet going down and losing the connection and having to take the time to reboot the computer and get all of that up. Because rest assured, if anything ever goes wrong uh, while I'm recording that here in the sanctuary, then that will necessitate me sitting down again and recording it because I do not want our online congregation to miss out on the message either. Now we begin a four sermon series this week uh, with the title Rediscovering Christmas. Rediscovering Christmas. You have no idea the folks that are out there that are, that are saying, well, what are we going to do about Christmas this year? What are we going to do? about Christmas like that's a, a logical question but when you really unpack that it really isn't a logical question because to say that Christmas is only dependent Christmas is only going to happen if we have Christmas trees and gifts and family gatherings and big dinners and big services that's to say that's the only way that Christmas can happen. And that's just not true. That is simply not true. Now, when the first Christmas happened, there were a handful of shepherds on a hillside. There was Mary and Joseph in a stable. There were three kings and their entourage traveling. There were astronomers that were wondering what was going on in the heavens. <laughs> you see, we have built Christmas into something that I would venture to say that did God ever intend it to go this way? They didn't have a Christmas tree. The only gifts that's even mentioned are from the wise men, from those three kings. So as we begin to unpack what rediscovering Christmas is all about, we begin this first sermon with finding hope in our uncertainties. Now, let's start off by me asking this. Where were you when? Every generation has its where were you when question about some cultural seismic event. Where were you when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon? Where were you when you heard that John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated? Where were you when you heard about Columbine? Where were you on 9-11? Where were you on the day the Challenger exploded? Where were you when the discovery did not come back to Earth? Where were we? Where were you? Moments like these you see are big. They change things. There's no going back. Culture shifts. Our lives are never the same. And unfortunately, many of these tend to be negative events, catastrophes, or tragedies. They strike with no warning and introduce a new sense of uncertainty into our lives. Is this beginning to sound a little familiar? Welcome to 2020. We've all been living it for almost a full year. Global pandemic, economic recession, mass unemployment, political division, cultural upheaval, racial reckoning, record wildfires complete with fire, tornadoes, extra powerful hurricanes and floods. Did I miss anything in the list? It's been bizarre, hasn't it? 
If it's not a new word of the year officially, it should be, and it would be this, doom scrolling. Those of you that have computers know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you're not doom scrolling, but maybe you're doom searching with the clicker for your television set. I'll listen to this news broadcast. Oh, that's just all negative. I'll listen to this news broadcast. Oh, that's all negative. Well, I'm just not going to watch the news. And what happens? COVID commercials come up. <laughs> Political advertisements come up. <clears throat> news flashes of what's going on around the world. Doom scrolling. It's perfectly fitting that this new word was added to our lexicon this year. It's actually a new word. You know, it's that scrolling through your news feed, social media, looking through your phone, just thumbing through the headlines, and we've all probably done it at one point or another, but hopefully we've all caught ourselves and learned to limit the doom scrolling before bed. <laughs> I hope that an hour before your bedtime, now an hour before my bedtime is a little hard to gauge. Emily knows where I'm going with this. <clears throat> Trying to anticipate an hour before my bedtime is any time that I sit down in the recliner. <laughs> That's within an hour of my bedtime. Does not necessarily mean that I get up and go to bed, but I'll guarantee you that I go to sleep and I'll hear this soft voice that says, honey, why don't you go to bed? <laughs> but Emily with her normal bedtime, which I'd like to say it's around 10 o'clock, sometimes it's a little later, but she always turns the TV off because she said she doesn't want any busyness in her mind before she goes to bed. That's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. <clears throat> I'm not trying to bring us down here, quite the opposite, but this is really we've all been something we've been living with for quite some time, and it really has been a tough year. If ever there is a year that we need Christmas, it's this year. Not with all of its traditions, but for us to understand what it really means. If ever there's a year that we need Christ, this is the year. This is a season of hope. Advent is all about hope. The word Advent means coming or arrival. And the holiday season is traditionally a time of expectation, waiting, anticipation, and longing, isn't it? It seems like all of the, the Christmas season or the holiday season all seems to find its focal point at Christmas. I can give you an example. Before Halloween, or before Thanksgiving gets here, Halloween is here. Halloween, everything starts showing up in the stores, and what do they do? They start putting out Thanksgiving stuff. And a lot of the stores at that time start putting out Christmas stuff. They just do. They rush the season. And it isn't very long until they start talking about Black Friday. Right? You talk to anybody that works in retail, they'll tell you that Black Friday is not the day that they dread. The day that they dread is the first business day after Christmas. <laughs> returns. All of the returns that come back. People that bring gifts back. I actually had <laughs> talked with one one lady in the in the return line at Walmart one time and she was the one that was mentioning that that she really didn't like the day after Christmas and she said you would not believe what people do she said you you just can't imagine the things that some of these people do the day after Christmas she said they will bring things in that obviously that they used that they only wanted to use at Christmas time and they'll bring it back can you think of something that you only use at Christmas time that you, re you could return after Christmas? A Christmas tree. Artificial Christmas trees. 
they'll buy an artificial tree and all the lights, take it home, put it up, decorate it, celebrate Christmas, bring it back, get their money back. But her comment that really struck my heart was this. She said, you have no idea how many bicycles get returned. How many children's games get returned? They allow their children to open the gifts and then they bring them back to the store. Folks, if that doesn't put a dagger in your heart, what in the world are people thinking? You see, the commercialism has got in the way of Advent. It has crowded things out. But folks, this year, we have an opportunity to be regrounded in what Christmas really means. Advent is not just an extension of Christmas. It is a season that links the past, present, and future. Advent offers us the opportunity to share in the ancient longing for the coming of the Messiah to celebrate his birth and to be alert for his second coming. Advent looks back in celebration at the hope fulfilled in Jesus' coming, while at the same time looking forward in hopeful and eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns for his people. Folks, if you cannot see how society and the world is fast approaching a huge event. People say, oh, well, we've heard that Jesus is coming again our whole lives. Well, you know what? Then that means it's closer. People heard for centuries that Jesus was going to come, and yet they never gave up hope. One of these days, folks, the clock is going to quit running. One of these days, Jesus is going to come. I overheard two fellows talking one time. <laughs> one of them had bought a new car. And his friend asked him, he said, why in the world did you buy a new car? You can't afford a new car. He said, I just wanted to have a new car. He says, well, what if Jesus comes? What are you going to do with the car? He said, you can have it. <laughs> During Advent, you see, we wait for both. It's an active, assured, and hopeful waiting. But really, what is it for us? It's a time to repair our hearts and help us place our focus on a far greater story than our own. The story of God's redeeming love for the world. It is a season of digging deep into the reality of what it means that God sent His Son into the world to be Emmanuel, God with us. It is a season of expectation and preparation, an opportunity to align ourselves with God's presence more than just the hectic sense of presence. Gifts. So wherever you are on your level of 2020 anxiety and uncertainty, Wherever you are on your own spiritual journey, I invite you into this season of Advent. We've been given the opportunity to rediscover Christmas. So for the next four weeks, we're going to be exploring the attributes of Christ. Encapsulated in his birth and the Christmas season, we find these four truths. Hope, peace, peace, joy, and love. Today we begin with rediscovering the hope of Christmas, even when we are surrounded by uncertainty. Now, as we begin to explore these themes of Advent over the next four weeks, we'll see how they relate to and are exemplified in different characters in the story. But first, let's cover a little background to the times that people we're living in. I'm holding off reading the passage. And here's why. We think that we have it bad today. I just told you. Gave you a litany of things. 
We think we have it bad. But so did Israel back in the days of Christ's coming. During the time of Jesus, when they, like much of the world, were a defeated nation under the thumb of the Roman Empire, they saw no hope. It was a harsh day to live in, a time of conquest and brutality. They saw society as hopeless. It had been many years since the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the calling out of God's people. The time between the Testaments was several hundred years. It had been many years of being invaded and conquered by enemies like the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and then the massive empires of the Greeks and Romans. It had been generations and generations since the formation of God's covenant with humanity, promising a Messiah to make things right, to bless humans and restore all we humans had messed up since God's perfect creation. <laughs> things were a mess. And they didn't see hope. And yet they held on to the promise, even though things seemed hopeless. The fulfillment of God's covenant and the coming of the Messiah who would come to make everything right wasn't just a happy idea that drifted in and out of the Israelites' consciousness and culture. It was their deepest hope that sustained them and encouraged them and spurred them on, especially through thousands of years of uncertain waiting. They clung to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis 12 too, all people on earth are going to be blessed, he was told. And they're going to be blessed through you, he was told. The fulfillment of God's covenant and the coming of the Messiah, who would come to make everything right, wasn't just a happy thought. But the question was this. Oh, how long? O oh God, was the cry of the ancient people. And how long can hope survive, especially under the world-changing forces of the Greek and Roman Empire? Their whole society, their whole culture was being bombarded and systematically destroyed. And those same cultures of the Greeks and the Romans, we are still influenced by today. Because of those things, society finds their influence even today. Were there even, were there even embers of hope left smoldering or were things gradually burning out? As we see in Luke's biblical Christmas story, the answer is yes. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler. Jesus the Messiah is born on that first Christmas. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and let you in in case you didn't know where we were going. <laughs> Jesus is born on that first Christmas. I know that comes as no surprise, but I tell you that because I'm going to pick up Luke's narrative in a rather unusual place. Most of the time we end our Christmas pageants and programs with Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the stable scene and the shepherds come and visit and go back to their flocks in the field. Sure, we sneak the Magi into the nativity because it's more convenient to get everybody together for one last group number in the Christmas pageant. We all sing Silent Night and roll the credits. We have all set through Christmas pageants. And if I opened up the conversation for everyone to to participate and to share a memory of Christmas pageants, every one of you would be able to share a humorous story of either one of your children, your grandchildren. I know of one story where Mary dropped the baby Jesus that was an electronic baby Jesus and as it bounced out of her lap onto the floor, you could hear this electronic doll screaming, Mama! Mama! <laughs> 
We all remember those stories. <laughs> and okay, Luke's Christmas narrative does end the night of Jesus' birth with the shepherds' departure. Not the three kings, mind you, but the next. Ongoing scene in Luke's story comes right after it. I'd like for us to look at a more close scene found in Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 38. And it is on the back of your bulletin and those watching online, it will come up on the screen. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. He had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God and fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. God's word for God's people. You see, Simeon and Anna were sparks of hope in Israel. More than that, they were torches of hope, expecting God to come, to come through, and to do what He had promised. They believed this. They were waiting for this. They anticipated this moment like no other. Both Simeon and Anna are likewise elders in this story. <coughs> they both have lived long lives. They have seen and experienced many things, both hardship for their people and pain in their own lives. We know Anna specifically had been a widow for decades, a position of very low social status in that culture. She would have been an outcast. But we know both Simeon and Anna have remained faithfully devoted to God through all the years. They are ready to see God act and to do great things. Did you notice that in the account that we read, neither Simeon nor Anna seemed to be the least bit surprised or uncertain about the fact that this baby Jesus is the long-expected Messiah? They never mention one bit of doubt. 
On the contrary, they were excited to see that they had lived long enough to see it come to pass. Almost everyone else in the Christmas story so far has taken a little convincing about the whole arrangement. Granted, many of the others had an angel appear with a heavenly announcement. And it kind of caught them off guard, if not made them completely terrified at first. But I think that God didn't need an angel to get, to the, mes get the message to these two faith giants. They were ready to see. They were ready. They were tuned in, waiting, watching, listening, and expecting. They were filled with hope, and that hope made them ready. Day after day, year after year, Simeon and Anna had served faithfully, inspired and fueled by the hope that God was at work, even though they couldn't see it. Even if they were surrounded by hardship, even as time passed and they grew older and older, Simeon and Anna still held on to hope and they fostered new and renewed hope as they set their focus repeatedly on God. Worshiping Him, serving Him, serving others, taking one step faithfully at a time as they waited. What are we doing today? taking faith one step at a time. Of course God came through, they might have said. This is what he said he would do. The Messiah is here. And they rejoiced and celebrated and infused new hope into the people around them, including Mary and Joseph. They were surprised to hear Simeon and Anna speak in the way that they did. And yet Mary had seen an angel. Joseph had been visited in a dream by an angel. And yet they were surprised to hear what Simeon and Anna had to say. Simeon and Anna reveal several things about hope and its power that we can take away and apply to our lives in these ways. Hope sees beyond. It sees beyond. Hope is the fuel of faith, the fuel of dreams, and the fuel of possibilities. Hope is that whisper of maybe, just maybe. It's the spark in the cold darkness that catches flame. It's the flicker of first light on a new morning. That's what hope is. Hope sees beyond what immediately catches our eye. It goes beyond that. It's expectation. No matter how bad your year has been, no matter what kind of problems and struggles you're facing right now, no matter what kind of season of darkness and pain you're in, let me encourage you not to abandon hope. Hope is still alive even in our deepest pain and most hopeless of circumstances. Hope chases away the darkness and the uncertainty in our lives. Hope is alive because God is with us. Emmanuel. God with us. And as long as God is with us, hope never dies. We may think that it's being extinguished. We may think that it's growing dim. But hope is as much alive and burns just as brightly as it ever did. Are we willing to see it? Are we expecting it? Are we asking for it in our own lives? Romans 8 is a well-known chapter in the Bible, but there's a section of it that often gets overlooked. In this chapter, Paul starts off clarifying, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus in 8.1. He then explains our relationship as God's children and what it looks like to live by God's Spirit. He then shifts to our future when God will fulfill His work in us and restore all of creation. Take a look at Romans chapter 8 
verses 24 through 26. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. God's Word. Romans 8, 24-26. Hope precedes our present reality. Hope, by its very nature, exists in the uncertainty before. It exists in questions, it, in doubts even. It's that unclear sense of what is to come, but hope is the willingness and the desire to believe beyond what our present circumstances and reality are presenting to us. It's willing to say there's more to this than what appears. That leads us to the second point. God is with us here, now, and always. Friends, with God there is no uncertainty. God knows your pain and challenges and struggles. He was not taken by surprise when a new coronavirus mutated and spread and went global. That didn't surprise God. He was not surprised when the economy froze and sunk. He was not surprised when you or your loved one received that dreaded diagnosis or call in the middle of the night or heard those words that broke your heart or shattered your world or left you in confusion or uncertainty. God was not surprised. He sees you. And he's always there. And he is here. He is Emmanuel. God with us. And this hope he delivers. This hope he embodied and fulfilled and brought into the world so long ago. This hope that he offers today. This is not a hope that he dangles before us, taunting us with it just out of reach. It's real. It is not a hope that he demands us to conjure up as we struggle in our life's worst moments to achieve. It is real. This is a hope that He infuses us. He infuses us with this hope. It is a hope filled and fanned within us by the Holy Spirit, even in our weakness, even in our grim circumstances and deepest pain, when the faintest gleam of hope seems too far away or oh so impossible when we feel too weak to carry on, when we feel our grasps slipping on even the ability to try to hope, His Spirit is still within us. His Spirit helps us to restore hope by reminding us of God's faithfulness and promises. His Spirit leads us into God's Word and His reminders of all that God has done for us and all that He has promised to do. God has not changed. He has not left the scene. <laughs> our God, our Emmanuel, who is with us, has promised his people throughout history and us today messages of hope, including these. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you says, Do not be afraid, for I, has I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of opposition, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. God's promises for us. Do you feel the hope Leaping in these words, we are not alone. Even at our loneliest or darkest moments, Christ has come. Our God is with us every step of the way. And lastly, 
hope inspires us to carry on. The Apostle Paul described the cycle of hope like this in Romans 5, verses 2 through 5. Because of your faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation, and this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. Romans 5, 2-5. You say this hope, this hope from God's Spirit does not put us to shame, will not let us down, will not disappoint us. Instead, it gives us new and growing strength to see beyond the pain and confusion that is all around us and right in front of us. It can be so hard to lift our downcast, tear-filled eyes to look for that tiny spark of hope when we feel swallowed up by our pain. It can seem so difficult to reach beyond our troubles, to grasp our Lord's outstretched hand. It can feel so impossible to take that first step towards hope when we are weighted down by our burdens, isn't it? When we receive the promise of hope in God's word, we find new strength. When we accept the power of hope granted to us in God's spirit, we find new inspiration. When we focus on the power of hope embodied in the birth and life and death and resurrection and return and eternity of Jesus, we discover new strength to take that first step and keep on stepping, walking, and maybe even running one step at a time. Hope inspires us. Hope emboldens us. Hope builds upon hope and keeps us going no matter what. So what is your next step of hope for today? You know I like questions. <laughs> what is your next step of hope in this Advent season? How are you going to respond? So often we as humans want to see what happens tomorrow. And we want to see it today. We want to know the future. We want to skip to the end of the story. Our lives don't just simply work like that. It's not a privilege that we've ever been granted. We can't see the future. Now mothers, on the other hand, can look at a child and say, I know what you're thinking. I know that you think that you're going to do this. But let me tell you what will happen in the future if you do. In Christ, we have been given the end of the ultimate story. In Christ, we have been given true life that transcends the pains of earth and the brokenness of our present world. In this Advent season, we can find hope in the arrival and life of Jesus. We can draw hope from God's faithfulness in fulfilling His long-awaited promise of the Messiah. We can focus on the hope of God's continued work in and all around us that will one day take away even the need for hope as we realize the reality of God's full restoration. In the midst of whatever life is throwing at us, we can experience the hope of God's Spirit within us, carrying us, strengthening us, emboldening us, and giving us the strength to take that next step that is right in front of us. Friends, my invitation to you this morning is to take a step towards hope in this Advent season. Hope is dawning, you see. Christ is coming. He is returning again. Let's welcome Him into our hearts and lives every day in this season of expectation and hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of your word and the way, Lord, that our hearts are pressed towards hope this morning. We look around and we see so many things that we could say are hopeless. 
but they are not because hope is eternal. Hope is in you. Hope is promised through your Son. It does not matter what we face, what the world is going through. Hope is not diminished or eradicated or wiped out. Hope is alive because Jesus is alive. Hope is real because Jesus is real. And our lives can take on new hope to rediscover the joy and to rediscover Christmas in a brand new way. But we need your help to make it happen. Oh God, we pray. Amen.